Well, How's guys, welcome. This morning. Doing good. Welcome to uh, the Tuesday Notary Titans call on Tuesday, June 11th. It's uh, 8 o'clock Pacific time. Carol, thank you so much for joining us after uh, your 50th anniversary celebration. Five, five, six. Five, six. That's right. Five, 56 years. Congratulations. Uh, Laura Buer, thank you for joining us as well. I know you've got a pretty crazy schedule and you're teaching, so thanks for taking some time out today. Uh, guys, uh, what's that? Absolutely. We've got some really great questions. I think some thought provoking questions that will dive deep and we've got some real uh, kind of service level questions too. So it's pretty nice. Um, uh, well-rounded group of questions that I really want to dive into before we do that though, Carol, what are you excited about this week? You know what I really am excited about, honestly, because I never go anywhere. <laughs> But nothing, no, seriously. No, I'm excited because we have had a record number, I'm going to sneeze, of graduates these last, this last week. Mm. And what that means to me is that I really get to dive in and get to know my students. Because this is when they start needing me for mentoring. This is when I get to be into that exciting time when they're doing their first signings. I got a call yesterday from one of my students who's in Texas, and he's been very, very worried, very nervous, asking lots and lots of questions. And he called yesterday, and he had two signings. Wow. And he was so pumped because this is what he's been working for. And so that's an exciting time for me uh, when I get to spend time on the phone and you know watch people all the hard work that they've put in, all of the calling on the list and all the stuff that they do is now coming to fruition. And, and this is a time when they're both very, very nervous, but also very excited because they're watching their careers start to bloom. So that's, that's primarily what I'm really excited about. Well, that's a great thing to be excited about. I uh, totally agree. There's no feeling like that in the world. And we're having kind of a similar experience over at Sign and Drive too. And to me, what that's, uh, says when you hear so many graduating from Notary to Pro, and I know a lot of students are in both courses, I really feel excited about where the industry is going to go as well because the, the bar is being raised. Raised. You have been working on this since, since 2012. Then the newbies like so me carry. Here, And we're really, uh, I think people are really committing to uh, the Kaizen and continued improvement and really taking this business seriously. And now we send them to Laura. I know. I love it. Now they can, they can really expand between you and I, and then we send it to Lori. We're talking about the cream of the crop, the top I love it. people in the next couple of years, right? Abs oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and then speaking of Laura, Laura, what are you excited about this week? I'm excited about all of the collaborative projects I'm involved in. Almost too many. <laughs> it's really hard to keep my fingers on everything. But I've got that power of attorney skill builder coming up uh, on June 22nd. And if you're on the call today and you haven't signed up, you might want to think about that because we're going to have examples of powers of attorney, talk about what they are and the different environments you'll be asked. They are the number one documents asked for in general notary work. Right behind that on June 30th is living trust. We're going to redo that. Uh, and I can't believe how many people said, hey, we need this information. We want to know that level. We want to see those documents. So we're going to repeat that for you. Uh, and that's on the 30th of June, by the way, three in the afternoon. And then da, 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 we will be opening ticket sales for symposium next week. And so you'll start to hear me talk more about that. Our speakers are set. We will have um, their uh, bios and their topics all on the website for people to see who's going to be there. Different speakers for different locations, Southern California, Northern California. So if you're a California notary, exciting news for you. Um, I've been asked to speak at a, a national conference. That's not a, not national, a um, state conference. That's not NNA. So I'll let you know when I'm able to announce what state that is that I'll be going to. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then the National Notary Association's conference in Scottsdale. Guess who I get to work with? Who? Da, da, da. Bill. 
Bill and I will be putting together uh, a collaborative project there as well. So I just want you to see that it's not just about notarizing documents. You really can expand your notary world beyond that and collaborating with fellow uh, colleagues in our business can really take you places. So I'm blessed and fortunate to work with Bill and with Carol um, and with others. And I just look forward to working with each one of you. Awesome. I love that. I love that, Laura. And I think that what I love about what we're all doing here, just even on the TNT calls, we're demonstrating collaboration, guys. And there's so much power in uh, connecting with like-minded people. That's where we gain momentum. We gain, gain perspective and really start to move the needle on what we want to do in our business, in our industry as a whole. So awesome, Laura. I'm very excited for you. Thank you. And then um, I'm going to take a turn as well because I am pretty excited. Uh, you know, I always got something in the works. And then this week, finally, uh, we're up upon the public speaking masterclass um, being offered by Dustin Hogan, the founder of the Rockstar Academy. Guys, if you have any dreams or aspirations of leading people or uh, leading a meetup group or training people or talking about your passion, sharing your story somewhere, whether it's in this business or somewhere else, even if you have this desire to have dynamic and powerful conversations one-on-one -on -one with potential clients, public speaking uh, can help you do that. And this Saturday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, there is a free training. It's completely free. It's about an hour and a half long being delivered by a well-known uh, public speaker. He's on the circuit in Canada and the US, Dustin Hogan. That's free, I put the registration link for that, for the living, the paid trust and the POA free training all in the chat window for you. So that's all there for you. So we're gonna dive in now and uh, talk about some questions. Well, first of all, Let's start out with uh, kind of a, a, a topic that is that needs to be talked about right now, and this is the elaborate um, scams that are coming through uh, emails. They look like signing orders. It's very deceptive, um, and I know that the three of us are definitely passionate about this, and I know there's several of you out there who have been sending in emails and questions because it's, it's pretty bad right now, and they're getting pretty sneaky. Carol, do you want to chat a little bit about that? Yeah, I do, because uh, as I don't know if people remember, but I was hacked very recently so bad that I have a I have a company that I pay a, a lot of money to to protect my computer because I have a lot of information, you know, students names and addresses and emails and everything. And um, I noticed there was something funny going on with my computer. Just wasn't right. Little things. And that's the first thing you need to look for is anything that's odd about your computer. Flashing, uh, things closing out, opening up. And uh, what happened to me basically was that when I got my geeks on the phone to get into my computer, they showed me that I had at that point in time, and I've re I'm repeating this because I know a few months ago I talked about it, but I had 10, 10 people at that moment when they were in there, in my computer, they were what's called the dark web. And what they do is they get into your computer and they use your IP address to hack into people's bank accounts, their computers, their email addresses. And there was, there was 10 in there and I think 19 or 20 waiting to get in. He showed me where they were, he could find them. And if somebody gets robbed or, you know, whatever happens, they trace it back to your IP address. So that's the most serious consequence. But we have so many others now, and I'm getting questions all the time now. The latest one is a couple of things. You're going to get an email from somebody that might have like a hotmail address or some kind of a very unprofessional email address that is offering you a wonderful signing, you know, 86 pages, five minutes from home, $250, and you have to link, you have to, you know, click the link on the page and accept it or they're going to send it to somebody else. One of them is from First American Title. The things that you have to look for are very obvious things. Check the spelling on, the, on these things. 
so many of this stuff comes from people probably overseas somewhere and they don't spell they'll they'll spell the words like their t h e i r instead of t h e r e look for the details carol if, yeah i'm sorry can i bring up an example as you're talking cuz one Absolutely. of my students posted it i'd love to share it this is from yeah Peg. did you get a pic- a picture of it yeah so we'll oh, just great. bring it up so you guys can kind of see because what i wanted to point out since you're talking about spelling look yeah. at it's first america yeah instead of a, a first american so and it's too good to be true, $250. I mean, we know how that goes. Those do exist, but that's probably not true. So I'm sorry to cut you off, but there, I just wanted to kind no, of No, that's okay, you. but I just want people to understand it's not just a matter of them going, oh, you know, thinking you're going, oh, darn, well, this isn't real. This is serious because what happens is, and it happened to one of my students who's an extremely intelligent human being, and he clicked on the link. That's what they want you to do. They want you to click on that link because then that gives them access to your computer one way or another. Somehow they are able to get into your computer when you click links or they, or they could put, you know, these bad viruses and things in there and absolutely ruin your computer. So just be every email that you get, just be very, very careful and um, and really take a look, very careful look at it, and use your common sense. And what I tell everybody all the time, follow your gut. Your gut is going to tell you if it's right, wrong, poisonous, you know, whatever. So that that's really all I have to say about it, but just be very careful. Yeah, great. Great advice. So Laura, are you still with us? Are you still on? She may have stepped away. Um, the the real key indicator there, guys, because even sometimes the typos and the misspellings can be good, but the if if a signing order comes from a Hotmail or AOL or one of those accounts, that should be the first indicator. It's hard to say that everything that comes from those is going to be a scam, but it should be a really good indicator. And if you have to click a link to see additional information or get documents, or if they're willing to send you documents for a borrower, even before that you've accepted an order, that should also be a red flag because you can't just be sending out personal information all willy nilly uh, out there. So Laura, do you have any other, have you encountered anything else regarding this? You know, I've seen those uh, emails that Carol described. Um, That would probably be the most, uh, common one related to notary specific uh, documents. Um, Of course, outside of that, I continuously get uh, for accounts that I have, for instance, Square. If anybody's using Square accounts to take in their money, I get these um, emails and it looks exactly like Square Up. I mean, it's very difficult for me to find the problem with it. I just happen to know my accounts well enough. And I'll say, you took in, you have a, a dispute of you know, $475. Okay, I don't have a single job that that's that right amount of money. So I know something's wrong there. Or it'll say, you just took in a deposit yesterday of, you know, this amount of money. Uh, click here to get it into your account now, instead of waiting a couple of days to clear. Um, and those uh, I continue to send Square, and I'm sure other companies want to see this. And so Square has something just for, I think it's spoof at square squareup.com for spoofs that are being sent so that they can better detect what's happening and who's doing this and how to do that so if you are getting these and they're trying to replicate a reputable company or company you have an account with i would forward it to that company so that they can see what's happening i don't know what they can do about it specifically but i do know that they are they have departments that investigate this and do take actions you know, these people that are sending these out have become so much more sophisticated mm-hmm. over the years that it, we used to be able to spot these things. Yeah. Uh, some of them, uh, if I could speak to this. Um, so there's ways to protect yourself, include VPNs, which hide your IP address. Mm-hmm. It bounces you around, so it's hard to track. Um, Malwarebytes is a great program for just searching your computer for anything malicious. It's free. Uh, don't use McAfee or Norton. They they have had a million bajillion problems. Um, also, two-step authentication whenever you can do it, because it sends a message to your cell phone, 
and then you can confirm that it's you. Other people trying to log in, they won't see the code, therefore they won't be able to log in. And a password protector like LastPass or Dashlane, where, um, so it sounds like Carol, you might have actually had a Trojan, a worm, or a keystroke logger where they literally watch you type your passwords and then log into your stuff. So, um, yeah, when it comes to the internet stuff, I mean, the means of protection are pretty simple. Most of them are free. Um, I put a link in the chat for uh, VPNs that are super cheap. You don't need anything super complicated. You just need something to bounce your IP address around. Nice. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's great. If you all hear about me watching porn all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting them all the time, all the time. Threatening me if I don't buy the bitcoins. Oh. Exposed pictures of me on my computer while I'm sitting here watching porn. <laughs> Carol, we talked about this. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. You gotta have a hobby. I guess. Yeah, everybody's gotta have a hobby. Uh, all right. Well, let's dive in. We have some amazing questions. First, let's open it up for anybody who's on the call today. Do you have a live question like you'd like to unmute and ask? If you don't, that's okay. As you muster the courage or figure out the mute buttons, we're going to jump into the I, I oh, that one. All right. Um, so I had somebody reach out to me today. I thought it was somebody trying to uh, do a, a hacker trick on me um, through LinkedIn. And it's really somebody trying to sell me stuff, I think. Um, but the question I, that it leads me to is, uh, when and where is DocuSign allowed? I'm pretty sure it's not allowed for places like California, but are there situations, places, whatever, where DocuSign or online virtual digital signing is a thing? Laura, do you want to take this one? Well, I think two things. Uh, one, DocuSign is uh, online execution of documents and, and not notarization. Um, DocuSign, for instance, I uh, have that going on with my house that I'm purchasing in California, which will close next week. And the only documents are disclosures, the rent, the contract, those are the kinds of documents we're signing electronically, and that's perfectly fine. There's, there's a, that's covered under a law that was put in place 20 years ago um, for handling things, uh, signing things electronically. Uh, in terms of uh, notaries, uh, of course, there are, I think are about 11 states right now that have adopted uh, on well, that's remote online online notarization, meaning my customers right in front of me, and I'm just doing electronically is in most states acceptable uh, for whether regardless of what the document is. Um, and then of course we'll have the remote online coming soon. But the docu the uh, docu sign that I have experienced has been for real property. It has been for just other kinds of um, contracts uh, between myself and another company that had nothing to do with real property, but none of the documents ever required notarization. And I think that was the common thread, is that it was execution of documents only. Did that answer the question? Okay, good, good. Nailed it. Anybody else live? Good morning, Bill. This is Anna. Hi, Anna. I have a question. I recently read a Facebook post uh, um, yesterday about uh, there being an oath document to sign. And what it was is there were three different options. One is we, we uh, do, uh, as notaries, we uh, notarize the acknowledgement. We notarize the jurat. And then there's something called an oath. Yes. So I'm wondering, because my understanding is that we only have acknowledgement in Jurat. And so I was hoping that maybe Laura could uh, explain this a little bit better. Absolutely, Laura. <laughs> well, I'll take it away. <laughs> so actually, in, in uh, all 50 states, there is a notarial act called an oath. Um, and that is a standalone notarial act separate from um, a verification upon oath or as we know it, a giraffe, um, which is the more common thing that we would handle. So um, there are documents that have an oath for, and it's written, 
Um, in loan documents specifically, it's jurats or verification upon oath. I have not seen in my almost 16 years a document within a loan signing package that they just wanted an oath. Not that it can't happen as documents change. I have not seen that. What I've seen is their jurats. Um, a couple of rules of thumb for you to think about or look for to identify this. Typically, an oath will not have subscribed and sworn. It will say duly sworn or sworn before me. It's going to be missing uh, that subscribe part, and that might identify it. Um, the name of the document is not an affidavit because affidavits have jurats. Uh, that's just part of the definition of what an affidavit is. Uh, so that would be another way to know that you're dealing with a jurat, not an oath or affirmation by itself. Um, and there are, um, uh, regarding the ceremony of, you know, raising the hand, that is optional. It is a ritual that we place a lot of value in because it helps reinforce the seriousness of what they're saying. Because if they lie to me, they go to prison. And that, again, can be in any state because it's a felony offense to lie, to commit perjury. Uh, so I'm hoping by describing that a little bit, it might be more helpful to you to know that, yes, it is a notarial act. It's probably not that notarial act in a loan signing package. But in my general work, I do handle them frequently. In an attestation clause with a will is one of the times I handle it. Um, an oath of office. And an oath of office in California, I can't speak to all states, but in ours, which there's a written oath for us to say, yes, I promise I'm going to be a good notary, it actually says subscribed and sworn before me, and that's all it says. Why the Secretary of State chose to use the ID words for a jurat, subscribed and sworn, is beyond me, but it's really an oath. It's like the exception to the rule. All the times that I see documents that are missing the word subscribed, I'm believing it's an oath. Another way you might find it is at the top of the document in the opening statement. It might say, duly sworn before me, and then it goes on to say whatever the document says. That's an oath right there. And so there's no mandated wording in any state for an oath as a notarial act, so it could be anything. The whole document could be the oath. The second thing is, since there's no mandated certificate language for the notary, then the notary would sign and stamp at the bottom of wherever they signed their document, their oath, and, the, and uh, that would complete it. The, the, um, the document wording becomes the certificate wording is really what's happening. And although it's good to have a venue, it's actually not a requirement for an oath. So, so those are the things I know um, about an oath. And I got that information, by the way, if, if it's California, my handbook on page 12 of my 2019, um, also from page 25, code 8202, about affidavits being jurats, also from the 2012 newsletter from the Secretary of State of California. Also, I went just to the definition. I went to the dictionary to see what's the difference between oaths, affirmations, and then jurats. Um, so I have, oh, and then RULONA, which is the Revised Uniform Law on Notarial Acts. Do you see how many different resources I had to use to get to the explanation I had for you today? So when I hear somebody say, well, I looked in the handbook, didn't see it, or I saw it said this, and they think that's the whole answer, that may not be the whole answer. You have to look at a lot of places to get there. Is that unfair to us? Yeah, I think it is. But it's what it is, and if you choose to be a notary, we have to be diggers. We have to know where are the resources, how can I uh, find and piecemeal together the answer. So I hope I answered it, Anna. <laughs> Yes, you did. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Great question, Anna. And thank you, Laura. Great in-depth answer. Anybody else want to unmute and ask a question? This is uh, Marcia. Bill. Hi. Um, hi, Carol. Hi, Laura. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, vacation. I scheduled a year ago a week-long cruise vacation that's going to come up next month and kind of concerned right now with me just starting in the business with how to handle beginning and then not being available for a week. Um, I would like to just pose that question. How, how would you most, how, what would be the best way to handle it? Because I don't want to not dive in for a whole nother month until after I come back 
I really kind of want to, you know, do more now. I'm just really getting started. All but, right. Um, just want to know what's the best way to handle that. You got a great question and congratulations on your cruise too. I hope you have fun. Carol, you want to Thank jump you. in? Yeah, I'd like to respond to that. Yeah. This is why it is so important. And I know you're new in this, so it takes time to do this. But networking with people in your area, right. getting to know people that are close to you that you can trust is so important because while you're gone that month, if you have one or two people in your area that you can truly trust, a company reaches out to you, you can let them know, I'm going to be gone for a certain period of time, but here's somebody who's really good. They know what they're doing, they've been trained, they're a friend of mine, and you can rely on them. And make sure, of course, that that person that you're giving their name out knows exactly what they're doing and they're very good. Networking is just a wonderful way of being able to protect your client because if you have a group of people that you network with then that you can trust, you're not going to have to worry about losing your customers because your friends in your network group are going to be just as protective of you as they are themselves. So it's, I think it's just I, I'm really encouraging my graduates to form groups in their areas to get to know one another. Uh, Laura is a huge proponent of networking. I learned this years ago when I was in Arizona that they're not your enemies, they're not your competitors, that you, when you learn to work together and you give your work to people that you can trust, you not only the company that hires you knows that you have their best interest in mind because you're giving them good people when you recommend somebody else and and nobody in that networking group broke you know broke the unspoken promise that they were going to go after my client mm -hmm. so that's something if you have some people where are you located i'm in What's, um basically the southern sector of dallas cedar hill texas oh my gosh you've got so dallas, many people in your area so many good people uh, and if you if you'd like to, um, uh, you're not a student of mine, I don't think. Not yet, I will okay. be. <laughs> <laughs> because if you want to give me a call, I've got some okay. names that I can give you of people that are really, really trustworthy and good. That's what I would do. That's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah, there's a, a great network uh, in the Dallas area there too. Now, now. This is a relationship-based business, so um, following that advice is going to work really well for you as you grow and expand. The other thing, too, is a lot of these, like the larger signing companies that have the technology platforms, yeah. you can actually do out of office, and you can just let them know that you're in vacation mode and not available, and it doesn't necessarily ding you or damage you. Okay. Lori, anything else you want to add Thank to that? Thank you so much. No, I think those are the two biggest things is that I use a calendar um, for those larger ones that can take me out for a week at a time when I need that. But I think what Carol talked about, which is what I would have answered, is that find a friend, find two, make them your colleagues uh, in, in a setting where you trust each other to refer back and forth. And, and I have that where I'm at in Modesto. So, I mean, it can happen anywhere. How do you find them? You might find them looking them up on one of the registries. You might find them in this group here. You might find them in other places. That doesn't mean that they're the right people for you. You need to get to know them. You need to build a relationship and decide, is this a good fit for the two of us? Are we really like-minded people? Because this works great for like-minded people. It doesn't work great when you have somebody who says, I'll take your work, and they don't reciprocate. That's such a huge point. And I really want to kind of reiterate on that one because I think many the relationship building skills that we teach that you learn in Carol's course, you learn in mine, you get coached from Laura, that applies to your networking circle as well. So you don't just say, please come be my friend and give me business and I'll give you business. You really need to let that cultivate and grow. So it's important to come together, get to know each other. You're not always going to like everyone. You're not always going to be of similar mind as everyone. So you want to try to create experiences that allow you to get to know people so you can start to make those decisions. Okay. Great. 
Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. I had to mute. We had some background noise there. I apologize. Anybody else for a live question before we hit the PowerPoint? All right, let's jump in and do it. Got quite a few today, so I want to try to get through some of these. Uh, okay, this one's from Donald. In the field of insurance and real estate, it was customary to ask for referrals and reviews. Is it appropriate to do this as a mobile notary or signing agent? And what approach can be used? Carol, any thoughts on this? No, you know what? No, not really from me because when I was working, um, they just get, it was at a time that, that companies got to know you very well. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, it really wasn't a matter of needing to put a lot of referrals and things out there. They just knew you word would spread among signing agents. You, you developed your reputation. There's so many notaries now that it's difficult to do. And I know that there's places that you can ask. I think once you work for a company three, four times, I wouldn't hesitate. And I tell students this, if they, if you want to, if you're listed like on one, two, three, someplace where you actually have a place, or if you want to put it on your website and get just a little recommendation or something from these companies, but don't go after it the first time that you work for them. Once you've developed that relationship, then you can do that and put it on your website. It's a great place. Yeah. Great, great advice. Um, I'm going to kind of divide the question up a little bit because I think uh, I like where you went with this, Carol, with the signing companies getting referrals and acknowledgement from them. Laura, I'm going to ask you to come in in just a second about the general notary work and the power of reviews there. But first, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about asking for referrals in your loan signing business and growing, especially your escrow direct. I think there's a lot of power and it's a forgotten power uh, in our personal networks. We all know somebody in the real, real estate business, uh, whether it's a real estate agent or a loan officer. And one of the most powerful tools that I used for getting a connection to an escrow officer was asking my real estate and loan officer friends who their favorite escrow officer were or was and why. And then I connected and I asked them if they would be willing to connect me or make an introduction. And that was one of the most powerful ways I got my foot in the door in a lot of closing agents' office. Because for a closing agent, their ideal customers are real estate agents and loan officers. So when they call or email, they listen. So if they're making an introduction, it was a real e a lot easier. There's no guarantee that you're going to get the work. That's still on you to build the relationship, but you might also get your foot in the door. Laura, are you available to talk a little bit about the power of reviews and referrals in general notary work? I think you may have stepped away. Okay, we'll just move on. Well, real quick, I'll talk about it. In general notary work, it is absolutely okay to ask for referrals. In fact, I encourage you to do so. We had April San Miguel from Denton, Texas. She actually builds that into her strategy. So she's on Yelp and you Google her. She has amazing reviews. Those reviews make all the difference. This is your business and you can find a, a very classy way to ask your customers to give you a review. I think Google business too is a great place. Absolutely. Google my business gives you all kinds of resources for that. All right, this one's from Arthur. In your opinions, why are there so many discrepancies in the way mortgage and title companies handle trust verbiage? <laughs> some companies want the signer to write out all of the trust verbiage after their signature, and some don't want them to write anything at all. It's so inconsistent. Is there an industry standard? Carol? One of the most frustrating things that ever happened to me was when they came out with the new verbiage, which I love, which is uh, John Doe uh, as an individual and the trustee of the blah, 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 trust. There's right? a sample In fact, let's see. Yeah. But, okay, down below here. I loved that. But I went out on the very first time, Bill and I went out, we did a signing, and it was a long way away. It was one of these VIP things where they want you to drive, you know, a long way. And we did it. And I knew I had used this before. And so I had these people sign as an individual, which is their name. That's all they were supposed to have to sign. This was Bank of America. 
we get home, send the docs back, and the next day they're like, well, we wanted them to sign the whole thing. And we had to drive back there. It was like 55 miles to get them to sign. Yeah. The next day we had another signing, Bank of America, different signing service. And it had the same verbiage on here, the individual as a trustee. So I called them. I wasn't going to do this again. And I called them. And I said, exactly, how do you want me to have them sign this? Can they sign just as the individual, which is why they did this verbiage in the first place? And they said, yeah, that's fine. No problem at all. It was the signing service that decided that they wanted them to sign with the entire thing. Yeah. So I, in my opinion, I love the individual. I've never had a problem since. Uh, and I just have them sign as individuals. Yeah, there, you know, I love when logic prevails in this business because it, it's so rare sometimes. It doesn't always, it. it does not always work that way. The reason the verbiage was created as individual and as trustee was to eliminate the question so somebody could just sign their name, William Soroka. And that would work as an individual and a trustee. But there's some lenders still to this day that insist that you sign with the trustee on top. So William Soroka, comma, trustee. So I think Carol nailed it, though. She called the lender directly and just said, how do you want this signed? I still do that. I'll call the closing agent and just say, what is it that you want to see on this? And I do that because some are different. Some lenders will have you sign without the trustee, but the title documents they want with the trustee. There's just, there's no uniform umbrella statement that works for everything. Laura, had you, ex anything you want to share in your experience on this? You're on mute, by the way. Laura, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, you're on mute. Okay. There you go. So I agree with the two of you, no matter how much I think I know about trust, and I'm pretty versed on mm -hmm. trust themselves. When it comes to loan signings, you know what? I don't know what title has in mind. I don't know what the lender has in mind. And if it's not in my instruction, I'm going to call and verify because it's too inconsistent. And I don't want to spend that hour with the client only to find out I got to do it again. And I, and I have to say, I get this problem. I have this problem all the time because I do mentor, you know, my students and so many of them will call me with questions like this. And there are questions I have an answer for, but I don't know if it's right because it is so dependent on the lender, on the title company, on whoever's working on the file. So when we get to something like this, uh, call, I just tell them, just call. You've got to get the answer from this particular horse because somebody else might give you a different answer. If there was- One thing just a, a related to this, not the exact question, but related is as a notary, however they're instructed to sign, whether it's as trustee or they can sign just as individual, that is a totally separate issue from how you fill out your certificate. So just to bring out some states, many allow for a notary to include their representative capacity in their certificate, meaning they sign William Soroka, trustee of the Soroka Family Trust, right? So that all of that would be in the um, verbiage of your certificate. And other states, not just California, there are some other ones as well, that do not allow for that, which means even though he may have signed that way, which is perfectly fine, that's not how his name will appear in the certificate. Yeah, great point. Um, the, if there was one takeaway from this, guys, if you're watching this, it's in new uh, signing agents especially because mm -hmm. uh, I get these calls a lot, is it's okay to call and get clarification. This is one of those situations where you're, you're expected to. And I know in the beginning, you don't know, is this just something I don't know and I shouldn't call on? Or is this something I don't know and I should call on? But this is one of those situations where it's okay to call. And you're so right, because especially when they're new, they don't want to make a bad impression. They don't want to look stupid. And so, but that's why I tell them there are things that you absolutely have to get the answer directly from the horse's mouth, because I could give it to you incorrectly and you'd hate me forever. <laughs> so... <laughs> Don't be ashamed because some of these things cannot be answered by anybody but the lender direct. You got it. All right, from Amber, I'm actually trying to set up my website. I'm just wanting to know what type of information should I include in my website about my notary business. I'm using Google Business. Laura, I know you and I had a conversation a couple months ago, I think, about this. Do you have anything on the top of your head that you could offer, Amber? 
Well, I think the overriding direction I would give is create your website as if you're the one who's going to have to visit it. You're the customer. What is it you need to know? So if, if you're doing it for general notary business and I'm coming, I found you and now I'm coming to your website, I'm going to want to know what kind of service you offer, what, when are you available, how much do you charge, what does mobile mean? Um, I'm going to want to know those basic things. Do I need, what, what kind of ID do I need? You know, maybe the list. So pieces of information that help that client understand what they're getting because just because they found you doesn't mean they understand notary service or mobile service or any other service you might provide. So think of it always from the lens of the consumer who's going to come and visit there on the homepage. What do they want to know first? If you're a restaurant, I want to be able to click on your menu. I want to see what you offer and I want to see what you charge. So think about that. Yep. Great feedback. And then I'll add in there too, uh, your personality is a deal breaker sometimes. So I really encourage you to tie your personality in there. Tie value and personality in your website. Not necessarily on your homepage though. I, I totally agree with Laura. Give the customer what they're looking for because nobody needs a notary till they need a notary. So they're not, they're not just perusing profiles, checking out in case they need a notary one day. They've got a need. So if you give them what they need, you give them that value. And then if you have an about page, that really dives into who you are, why you're passionate about this and why you're special, uh, that can go a long way as well. Because really what the key differentiator, and you've been hearing this since Carol and I started doing these last August, is your personality is your key differentiator. Who you are and how you build your relationships makes all the difference. So you've got to portray that in your website too. And be careful with the font you use. A lot of people tend to use these fancy fonts. They're Very difficult to read. They're too small. They're too light. They don't, you know, people don't, read them keep it simple keep it simple informative right perfect great question amber great answers guys thank you from shoshana can i thrive as a signing agent and mobile notary in a restrictive attorney state in particular connecticut i think we we i think we do this each week but carol yeah. what do you think absolutely because i have graduates in every state mm -hmm. and we do have Georgia. I mean, there's a number of states where there's attorney states. And this is the way I tell people when they call me. You, it's not where the property is. It is not where the lenders are. It's not where the title companies are. It could be that you have somebody that lives near you in Georgia, for instance. But people are so transient in this country that that person who's living near you in Georgia might be getting a refinance on a home that they have in Oklahoma with a lender in New York City and a title company, you know, someplace else in North Dakota because that's the way things happen now. And, uh, and that work is open to you. There's no problem. You don't have to depend on an, on an attorney to handle that for you. So there's plenty of work. We've got students all over that are, are amazing me even now with the amount of work that they have because people in this country are constantly moving. Yeah. So yeah, no problem. Exactly. I, I completely agree. And first I, we've got to say, you know, we're not uh, a judge. We're not attorneys. We're not interpreting the law. So you always want to maintain um, integrity in your own state's laws. But the way I was explained, cause it's really hard to get a really straight answer, but there are thriving signing agents in all 50 States. Um, in the, the way it was described to me by an attorney who writes these legal documents is that we are acting as an independent contractor for the closing agent. Most of the laws are regarding the closing of transactions, not the gathering of signatures, which is our role in that. So whether an attorney is present or involved, that's the law, but what the, the role and the capacity that we have as signature gatherers, like if you really boiled it down, we are good to go in all 50 states for the most part. Laura, anything else you and want to throw in also Okay. I'm sorry. No, I think you guys covered it. <laughs> All right, great. What, there's also ahead, one other thing. Uh, if I could bring up, uh, there's odd rules in different states. Virginia, for one, they the only thing that the notaries cannot do is they cannot collect money. That means that they can't take the checks from the borrowers and deliver it along with the documents, but there's ways that they can do it. There's other ways they can take that they can give them a Federal Express uh, envelope 
and have show them where to send it. There's ways. Of, every state has these weird things, mm-hmm. and I hear about them all the time because we do have graduates in every state. So you just need to figure out how to work around some of those things. And yeah, there, there's look, always a way. Yep, exactly. And if you ever want to know, like – what the density of signing agents are. So you can go to signingagent.com and type in your zip code. And it, it's not real accurate information, but it gives you an idea. If you see signing agents in there that have been in there for 10, 15, 20 years, then there's probably a good chance that you're going to be making a living doing that. Victoria, in states that require a journal entry for every notarization, when you're doing the loan signing for a couple, and let's say you have four documents that need to be notarized by both of them, when do you actually fill in your journal and the certificate? Do you do it as you go along or do you do it all at the end? Laura, do you mind taking that one? I'm happy to. um, And what I'm going to tell you is not the law. What I'm going to tell you is uh, just my practice, which gives me the most efficiency at the table. And that is I do the certificates as I'm presenting the documents so that each document is notarized before it's flipped over. I've completed that certificate regarding the journal. I fill out the first line, so I have the ID and all that information. After that, uh, for for each person, after that, then I only collect throughout the signing the basics I need to remember that document. So the name of the document, the type of notarial act I performed, the time I did it, the first name of the signer. That's really all I need to collect as I go. Then... As they stop to read something, they got to fill out a statement of information, they got to fill out a survey, whatever stops them for a minute. Then I start backfilling anything I'm missing. So by the time I get to the end of the assignment, I have very little left that I need to do. Then while um, I'm QAing the package, I um, give them a journal so that, and I give them the instruction where to sign. I usually circle the X for one of them and say, okay, all the circled X's belong to you. All the non-circled X's belong to you. I need your signature on all of those. And then I need your, in my case, I'm California, your right thumbprint because they're real estate documents. And then while they're busy doing that, then I take care of the QA. So I'm integrating my process back and forth. My rule is everybody works at my table. Nobody gets to just sit and relax. (laughs) I I have a question, Laura. Uh Uh-huh. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Mm, okay. <laughs> I want to say what kind of morons, but I won't, I won't say that. Okay. <laughs> A little I'm sorry. But who came up with the brilliant idea that everything that you notarize, we, we've always kept everything that's been notarized in our journals in California, right? But to have everybody sign their name, fingerprint, every single line, I mean, first of all, the notaries are spending a lot of money on journals. Who came up with it? Probably the journal companies. What's the advantage? No, let's not go there. <laughs> let's not go there. It's the law. It has to do with the law. And I'll give you an example of some, you might call it rationalization or justification, but let me tell you the idea behind the law that I'd like to hear. It's in California. Yeah. So every document stands on its own. We see a package of documents, but they're all individual documents. And in a court of law, if something is challenged, individual documents are challenged. And the proof of the notarization needs to be laid out for every single document that could be challenged in a court of law. And having their signature to each one of those documents ensures that that was one of the documents signed. If you just put loan documents and they sign it, or if you, even if you have, you list out all of them, but only get one signature, it is not the same. You know how many loopholes there are in a court in law? So this is a way to button down. That's one reason. Let me give you the other one. If a member of the public in your state can ask for a photocopy of a line entry, you will only provide them the information that they provided to you. Meaning if they ask for the compliance agreement, that's the only thing they're getting. Even though you might have uh, notarized five other documents in the same signing, we only release based on the information provided. And so you need a complete line entry for them, including the signature. You cannot then include other line entries that don't have a signature. That just has a diagonal line and their name goes across it. 
So we're looking at the R and Richard. So it's incomplete. So I, I really, really hope notaries see um, the documents they notarize individually rather than a set of documents, a package of documents. It's not the whole. It's the individual documents, like the six to eight out of you know a hundred that we concern ourselves with and that we need to provide that information. Is it an annoyance? Yeah. Does it take me more time? Yes. That's why I have shortcuts. That's why I integrate the process. And I use the word acknowledgement stamps in my book. I use date stamps in my book to go faster. So I find ways to make it more efficient for me and I can do everything required for two signers in an hour or less, depending on the size, even the bigger packages, because I organize it the way I do. All right, so that is your long answer, Carol. Wow. For, you know, we've never really talked about it, you know, on the phone and, and everything. Does it make a little yes. sense? It makes a lot of sense. Okay. Love it. L listen, you know, I, I may be old, but but I'm always adaptable and willing to, yeah. to listen. Love it. So, All right, great question. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> All right, this one's from Patricia. My question is, how do you handle all the distractions that come up from family and foes? When I'm on a roll, here comes the need for someone else who could give a peanut about me completing my assignment for the day. So I can grow, oh, so I can grow this business. Or is it me, always making myself available to use? I think this is one of those deeper questions about distractions and being distracted from your dreams. Carol, Laura, any input, thoughts on that? Let me hear your inputs first. Yeah, okay. Put him on uh, that line. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is a big one. Um, and it's very real because we all have quote unquote distractions in our lives, whether it's kids, spouses, financial problems, um, lack of a vehicle, um, addictions, drama, whatever it is. We've all got that stuff going on. And I think the, the key is, um, for me anyway, I can only really speak from my own experience, but what I had to do is I had to realize that there is nobody in the world that ever got anything or did anything that didn't have those types of distractions right. in their life. They just had to reprioritize their, their dreams their, themselves. And that, the analogy I really like is you have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can truly be of service to anybody else. You have got to pull yourself out of survival into thrival. Thrival, that's not even a word. I just wanted it to rhyme. You can't be in survival mode. You have to get into thrive and then you can help other people. So it, it is important. The, the distinguishment for me was I am doing a disservice by saying yes all the time. I had to learn to say no. And that's where I really came into service. And I did that by drawing boundaries and saying no a lot more and honoring my time, which for me is mornings. I was not always a morning person, but my mornings were my time, my time to grow and become, and nothing could stop. Nothing was going to interrupt me. Even my mom, I tell her, you know, don't call me before 7am. That's my time, you know, unless somebody's uh, there's an emergency and we have a code for that two rings, you know, but that's my time. And the, that's how I started to move the needle on my business. Uh, just saying no and drawing boundaries. I'd like to, uh, to talk about that a bit because I know that a lot of uh, people out there, a lot of my students have families and their children are very, very important to them. And I learned years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I did things like sell Avon. I took my little girl with me and we'd walk the streets and, you know, sell Avon. I became a Tupperware dealer and a Tupperware manager. Uh, I involved my children in helping me pack up my Tupperware. But they knew that, that there were times that I had to go do a party or if I was on the phone or whatever I had to do, that was mommy time. She had to be left alone, but I'm going to give you plenty of time that's going to be all yours, or I'm going to find a way to involve you in my business. Mm -hmm. Kids used to love to line up at the Tupperware table every Thursday and beg Tupperware for me. And they got paid for it. Wasn't very much, <laughs> but there's these three kids, you know, and they're, and they're feeling useful. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really important. I mean, even now in my family, listen, I, they know 
many times, and I've mentioned it before how I'm in here during the middle of the night. But when I'm in my office, I'm busy. I'm dedicated to what I need to do. But, but they know that there's a time when I shut it off and that time is to spend with them, do what, what they want. And the same with Bill. He's been wonderful over these years. So, yeah, I think that if you consider the importance of the people that care about you and give to them uh, and make them feel important, but they have to know the boundaries. I love that. And, you know, one of my, uh, one of my, the favorite people that I uh, follow is Brendan Burchard and he, in his motivation manifest, he talks about this and it's reclaiming your agenda. It's claiming what is yours. So you're not, succumbing to everybody else's whims and needs and emergencies throughout the day or perceived emergencies uh, through email, text messages, phones, uh, and personal connections as well. Uh, so I highly recommend that read too. Laura, what do you think? I know you uh, were of like mind in a lot of these things. What do, what do yeah, you think? I really, without restating everything that you both already said, because I agree 100% with that, personally, that morning time, I started at five this morning. So I had time before I got to this eight o'clock um, to, to take care of email, to take care of any um, uh, agenda items that I needed to take care of to plan for my day, um, to take care of me. Even, and I, this morning I chose to sit out by my pool um, out on the decking there, still in my pajamas. I just sat there for about 10 minutes and just relaxed uh, out by the water. And it's going to be like 105 degrees today. So I was like trying to take in the coolness and, and just feel that sense of, of uh, calm before you know, the storm, before the day breaks out. And I think that it's important, whether you can get five minutes or an hour or whatever it is, to center yourself. Because then you have a better chance of either redirecting, deflecting, moving things out of your way to keep you moving on your own agenda. Love that. Really setting the intention. You mm -hmm. know, this is such an important thing because we are, uh, anytime we're doing something big, we're ch making changes, we are moving forward, you're going to hit resistance one way or the other. And one of the things that just human nature that we do is we make our problems bigger and better than everybody else's. So we say they don't understand because I've got this. So they don't understand. So it's almost like a it's almost a cop out. It's an ex we give ourselves an excuse not to move forward because our problems are better and different than other people. So they just don't get it. We can read all the you can you can subscribe to those systems and that technology, but I'm different, and it's not. Our, uh, we're not that special. We all have these major problems, and we're on a call full of positive people, and we all do positive things, but we're all dealing with our own shit. We've got some pretty massive stuff going on behind the scenes, and we all have that. So the first thing to do is to take yourself off the pedestal and just get into the strategies that actually work. You can do this no matter what's going on. There have been, there's always somebody who has it worse than us, so you just got to keep moving forward on it. There's one thing I want to <clears throat> say really quickly because this is an announcement I'm going to have to tell everybody. For many, many years, I have been available to my students to mentor them seven days a week, limited on Sundays, but it's getting to the point where I, Barbara and I both, we made a decision yesterday, as a matter of fact, that we're changing our hours. We're going to be available from eight in the morning till eight at night, Monday till Friday, but on Saturday, it's going to be noon, uh, eight to noon, and Sundays, no more. Sundays is our day. And unless somebody's in a signing and they let me know ahead of time that they're in the signing that, and so they can call me from the table, I'm no longer going to be working on Sundays and handling the phone calls. All right. I mean, it's, we're all an individual and we, we have, but for me, I have to have that one day, just one day, even if I'm at home, <laughs> you know? So Good yeah, you, that, that's very pertinent to, to what we're doing right now. Absolutely. You've got to do that. And, you'll, and I, I love that you're finally doing that. Talk about setting up boundaries and taking care of yourself. I love that, Carol. Thank you for making that announcement here. And everybody gets to kind of figure out their own too. So you'll figure it out as, as your business grows and expands. 
Uh, I'm going to, we're right at the nine o'clock hour, but we have so many great questions. It's really hard to just stop here. What do you guys think? One more or is this it? How about split signings? Are we not talking about that today then? No, no we're going to do a, a special training on split signings. Oh. So that's what we're going to do because it's a little more in depth. Okay. We can do that next week maybe. All right. I guess we're going to wrap it up here, guys. That's going to be it. We've got some, if you sent in some questions, they were all great. I can't wait to get to them, but it will have to wait till next week. Thank you guys for growing yourself and your business on the Tuesday morning. Laura, thank you for joining us and spending so much of your time. Carol, as always, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. You guys have a great week. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Laura.